I'm wondering if you can help me. I'm wondering if you can help me. And the way that I'm going to ask you to help me is if you have a computer that's up right now, or else if you have a cell phone that you're attached to, if you could put down the screen, if you could put away the phone for just a little bit, I promise you the emails will be there when you get back, and I promise you Facebook will still exist at the end of that. But I want to help you, and I have a message that I want to share with you. And the message that I want to share with you is quite simple, and it's this. You can persuade juries, not by accident, and even if you don't have the strength of personality in order to do so. Now, we had mentioned before about Dr. Paul Homily, and one of the things that he had taught us was be careful who your coach is. And I think that's very important because there's a lot of people out there that will tell you what you do right and what you do wrong and how you do it. And you'll be able to tell these people because they start every sentence with the word and the letter I. I do this. I do that. You should not do this. You should not do that. So be very careful who your coach is and who you listen to because there's a lot of bad advice out there in the world as we've all experienced. When it comes to PowerPoint and the use of effective PowerPoint, there is no place worse on the planet Earth than these seminars to get advice on how to use PowerPoint. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about how we do trial preparation and how to do PowerPoint effectively so it resonates with your jury. If you're not using PowerPoint or some sort of slideware right now, you need to start using it. And the reason why you need to start using it is very simple. But what I want to do is talk to you about what we do with trial preparation. The most amount of time that we do in trial preparation is at the bottom of the screen. At the top is the least amount of time. So tell me if this isn't true based upon your experience in life and being trial attorneys. Is there anyone here, and it's OK, who hasn't tried a case or done a motion through to decision? So we're all very experienced trial attorneys. And so what we do, and this is the way I used to do it too, you spend most of your time on cross-examination. Then the ne next most amount of time you spend on developing your theme of the case. Then comes jury instructions. Then maybe you're closing. Then you kind of think about your opening. And then the least amount of time that you do is your presentation of all of these things and practicing and rehearsing. So there's this big line between what is the most important thing to the jury and what is the most important thing to you as an advocate. We need to flip-flop that and give the most amount of consideration to the presentation. Because if you don't, because if you don't, it won't resonate. It won't be the type of thing that a jury will sit back and say, this makes sense to me. This is logical and it appeals to my emotions. And so therefore, it's actionable. I can make my own decisions. I can return those two sweetest words that we want to hear, which is not guilty. So why use PowerPoint? Why go forward and even bother to assemble it and put it together? And that's because the way that we in this society work. There's probably some of you right now that are having difficulty because you want to check your phones. You want to multitask. You maybe even have a transcript that's with you that you want to take a look at. And you're thinking about maybe, like I am, my daughter who's at home. We're a multitasking society. So what you need to do is you need to not take that for granted. So when it comes to the human minds and communication patterns, it's actually pretty simple. As the studies have told us through the years that there are three different main types of communication. The first type has to do with the visual. What you see, how you see it, how you interpret what you see. And believe it or not, that's the most important Next from that is what you hear, how you hear, the use of pauses, vocal intonation and inflection, how you get people's attention by changing the cadence, the pace of your voice to get to the point that you want to. That's the next most important. And the last one is that touch or that feel where you use your gestures and your hands and you say things like, 
please help me, instead of please help me. Those things are all important. So it's about seeing and what's in writing, hearing and what is speaking, and what you're experiencing and what you're doing. And especially when you have one-sided communication. Because with a jury, it's one-sided communication. You're not necessarily communicating back and forth unless you can do things like get them to nod their heads up and down with when you're presenting it, and you use your strong body language, and use rhetorical questions like, doesn't that make sense? And so what you're looking to do is you're looking to engage the two-way conversation instead of a one-way conversation. Even though they can't speak back to you, you need them to engage them on all three of those levels. The only way to do that is to do it by way of slideware, PowerPoint, or keynote. So the reason why is because our communication patterns and the way that we learn, the way that we learn is very simple. We have the verbal communication is 10%. That's why when maybe you come to a seminar and someone speaks to you and lectures at you, it may not resonate with you and you may not be able to take it home. Think about your favorite presentation that you ever had, that you ever had in school. Who was your favorite teacher? Was it someone who was dramatic, someone who told you and made you feel, or else was it someone who lectured at you? And I'm going to hazard a guess that it's not the person who lectured at you. It was the person who made you feel feel, made you think, made you feel like you are part of the learning experience. The next most way is what is visual. And then the most exponentially important way is the combination of the two, combining visual and verbal to make it actionable. But you have to do it the right way. If you do it the wrong way, if you don't do it in a persuasive manner, and I'll show you what is and what isn't persuasive, then you will fail. And most importantly, you will fail that citizen who's trusted you, that person accused who's sitting next to you, who has trusted you with everything. So you need to learn how to be effective. And it comes down to the way that our brains work. And there's the conscious and the subconscious and even the unconscious. And we need to take a look at stimulating all three of those positions in order for it to resonate like that pebble in the water that makes all the ripples go out. So you have that feeling, that connection, the belief that what you're trying to tell them is true, is correct, and is perfect. Because that's the only way that the jury is going to act or a judge is going to act. I use PowerPoints and slideware, particularly with judges. You want to know why? It's different. If you have a ho-hum vanilla DUI case, I do a lot of DUI cases, do you think that they've heard my type of closing argument or colleagues of mine before? Do you think they're tuning in, or do you think they're tuning out? If you bring in a good PowerPoint that resonates with them, they will remember it. They will more than likely agree with you if it's logical and it's emotional. So you need to even do it then. In fact, my anecdotal experience is that when it comes to judges, it is more effective than with juries. So when we take a look at this, we have to take a look at how the brain does it. And the conscious, of course, it has to make sense. And then the subconscious, you have to connect and make it actionable. This is the sorting and the comparison of does this make sense or does this not make sense? And then the subconscious, which is the unconscious part of it, which is the sensitivity, the innovative, the primal part. Does it make sense? Dr. Paul Homley tells us that the best way to do a presentation is a very methodical method which oscillates between the emotional and the logical, where you're looking to seek rapport and build up to the ultimate conclusion, which is what two words in our case when we're criminal defense attorneys? What two words? Help me. Come on, you guys are Ohio, right? Not, 
I'm PSU. You guys got to be louder than me, right? You guys are Oklahoma, I mean, Ohio State, not Oklahoma. I did not do that on purpose. So what are the two words that we're looking for? What is the yes? What is the action? What is the call to action that you want the jury to feel, to understand, and to believe? What are those two words? Right. Okay? So how do we do that? Well, it's actually a four-point process by way of PowerPoint. And if you realize four things, and only four things, then you will be able to make it make sense. You'll be able to do better in the courtroom, and it will resonate. It will stick, because you're going to look for that stickiness. And a lot of times, as we'll see here, when I come back and I talk to judges or juries, they come back and they say, what made the most sense to me was this one slide. The whole case resolved down to one slide. What a powerful statement if you can do that. So let's talk about where we are right now in our society. There are 300 million PowerPoint users in the world. Every operating system that you buy, every laptop, every tower that you have comes pre-installed with either Keynote, which is the uh, Macintosh version, or with PowerPoint. You cannot escape it. People use it every day. In fact, 30 million presentations each and every day are done by way of PowerPoint. Think about that for a moment. 30 million. About a million presentations right now are going on around the world using PowerPoint or some sort of slideware presentation. And you know what the truth is? It's really, really simple truth. Most of them absolutely suck. They don't suck, they suck big time, okay? They're horrible. And you know what you're doing when you do it horribly? You're putting them to sleep, they are dying, okay? And so they're dead out there. And so what you need to do is the traditional rules that maybe you were exposed to when you first learned PowerPoint, you need to throw away, cast out the window, and rethink the paradigm. How many people have heard of these stupid rules? You, ditch, you have to ditch the stupid rules, and the stupid rules are something like this. Seven lines per slide or less. Seven words per line or less. Well, it's just plain stupid. If you follow this rule, you end up getting a slide exactly like this. That is the worst way that you can use PowerPoint, is to use it in that manner. You are literally killing your audience. Do not kill your audience. In our job, if you kill your audience, if you do death penalty work, like I do, you might literally be killing your client. Or you're killing their lifestyle if they get branded a convict, a misdemeanant, a felon. So we need to be particularly careful about how we do it. And it turns out to be this horrible, vicious cycle. And it goes something like this. Bad presentations means bad communication, bad relations with your jury, less persuasion, poor verdicts, less time that you have in life in general, because you have to try more cases because you suck. And then it goes back over to bad presentations, and it becomes a snake eating the tail. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a better way of doing it. And just like Michael Jackson says at the end of the day, we can make the world a better place for you and me and the entire human race. And it's really simple to do. And the bottom line of it is that you can empower people to make their own decisions when it comes to PowerPoint. You can get there if you believe that you can communicate effectively with people and you can make it a better place so you're not killing your audience and you're making it actionable, okay? Make it a better place for you and for me in the entire human race, okay? You can do it. And you know what? It's really simple. Lesson number one, a little improvement. That's all I'm asking, is a little improvement goes a long way. Here's some examples. I didn't want to pick on people, so what I did is I got it from the internet. 
Take a look at this slide. It's not even in English, but I'm gonna tell you, if it were in English, it wouldn't matter. It's boring, it's awful, it's not actionable, it's not something that you'll remember, and it's just horrible. But that's actually a pretty good PowerPoint slide because here's a really bad PowerPoint slide because look at this jumbled up mix of stuff that doesn't make any sense, not just because of the fact that it's not in English, but because of the fact that it doesn't convey a feeling and emotion and it fails our three parts that we're trying to do. And here's another one. Just because you can jam things in a PowerPoint slide doesn't mean you should. In fact, you shouldn't. You need it to be simple. And some of them, when you're trying to present data, when you're trying to show juries things, you know what? That is a failure. That is an epic failure. I don't even know what the graphic is about. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And I doubt that the audience who was being presented it saw that it made any sort of rational sense whatsoever. But the bottom line of it is that there's some that are just absolutely worthless. Absolutely worthless. If you're making a slide like this, or you're looking at a slide like this, you can take nothing from it whatsoever. So the basic approach that I've developed, and I have went to Nancy Duarte's school on slideology. Nancy Duarte, by way of background, I don't like to do appeals to authority, because appeals to authority are the worst logical way that you can convince anyone. But I think that this particular appeal to authority of why it makes sense is very instructive to us. Once you imagine that there's this guy, and this guy ran for president, and he narrowly missed becoming president. He fell into functional depression, where he grew out a beard and looked like uh, Lars from the Hill people. And he was so functionally depressed that he lost the presidency that he could care less about anything, but he had one thought and one world-changing thought. And he'd been presenting it for years and years and years in academic situations. And it was a good message, and it was an important message that we all needed to learn. It was about the change of our, cli of our climate and what we're doing to, our, um, doing to our world and the carbon footprint and the need for change. But you're so functionally depressed because you lost the presidency that you can't possibly resonate and make it make sense. You're going to audiences that are half full in universities when they should be full, and it's because you've been tagged with the name of being the most boring person on the planet Earth who happened to invent the internet, so he says. <laughs> Anyone know who that man is? <laughs> who? Al Gore. Al Gore, okay? So that's where he was at the beginning. Nancy Duarte happened to be in the audience, and she said, you've got an important message, but your slideware is horrible. Let me just do some minor changes and work with me and we'll get somewhere. Well, boy, did they get somewhere. Cannes Film Festival, best film. Motion Picture Awards, best film. Oscar, Nobel Peace Prize. If you can take someone who is the most allegedly boring person on planet Earth, who is functionally depressed, look like Nanook from the woods, and you can turn them into all of those things, you can teach me. And what she taught me was this basic approach. Put as many words as you want on the slide initially. Pare it down to a few words. Replace all words with pictures. Do not use clip art. Use images that make you feel and use a transferable concept so it resonates. It's very simple to do. In fact, we're gonna do a couple of those. And it goes like this. You have to use wild imagery. You can't use simple imagery. You have to use imagery that fills the whole screen. This sucker's gonna eat me. I'm this close, should be the feeling that you have. Wild imagery. You can actually do a lot of informing with very little text. In fact, studies have shown that you can do more information transference to your audience with no text than with text. Text is a distracting event. It is totally distracting. I frequently do jury and judge trials where I only have three slides 
They're all pictures, and there's absolutely no text. And that's the best way to do it. That's what your goal should be. So here's another example. Let's run through it. I do mostly DUI defense. So what we're going to do is see that transformation. You can see how simple it is. So I start out with the basic facts. And this might be a typical PowerPoint slide that you might have presented in a jury before, or something like this. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I forgot. You add the nice little clip art that's in there, <laughs> right? The scales of justice. Because somehow or another, if it's not there in your presentation, then you know, we're not in a courtroom, I guess, or something like that. So let's read it out loud. Why you should find reasonable doubt in this case. Uncle Drinky the drunk guy was driving at 2.27 AM down the road with Officer Righteous behind him. Uncle Drinky the drunk guy swerved his car. Officer Righteous stopped Uncle Drinky the drunk guy. Officer Righteous says he smelled an uh, odor of alcohol. And Uncle Drinky the drunk guy had bloodshot and glassy eyes. Officer Righteous got Uncle Drinky the drunk guy out of the car to do roadside tests. Officer Righteous says, Uncle Drinky the drunk guy failed the roadside test, and the officer wrote that it was, quote, the worst drunk he'd ever seen try to do these tests. Uncle Drinky the drunk guy was arrested. He was told to blow in the machine. He nearly fell asleep. He refused. Uncle Drinky the drunk guy, and the other side of the story is, Uncle Drinky the drunk guy had a head cold that evening. He had a cough. He was sneezing. He had trouble breathing. He could not sleep. He rubbed and rubbed and rubbed his eyes because they were dry. Uncle Drinky, the drunk guy, lives by himself because he's a hep cat, lone wolf, never be tied down, man in a wolf pack type of guy. That's Uncle Drinky, the drunk guy. And Uncle Drinky, the drunk guy, got tired of not sleeping, so he went to the local 24-hour quickie mart where he bought NyQuil to sleep. Uncle Drinky, the drunk guy, guzzled the NyQuil before he drove, knowing he would be home in under 10 minutes before it took effect. Uncle Drinky the Drunk Guy had a big sneeze that caused him to swerve exactly one time. Uncle the Drinky Drunk Guy was stopped. He tried to breathe in the machine many times, but kept having a tickle in his throat because of his cold and caused him not to have a steady stream of air. They called it a refusal. That is the way that I just did it right now, that 95% of people do it. It is totally unengaging. You can read faster than I can speak. I have my back to you, you might as well not even have done that. It's worthless. It doesn't resonate. If you're doing that, you are actually doing worse than doing no PowerPoint at all. So what you need to do is take that text and then pare it down. That's the second step that's there. And this is better. Why you should find reasonable doubt exists in this case. Head cold, cough, trouble breathing, sneezing, could not sleep, rubbed his eyes because they were dry, lives by himself, tired of not sleeping, went to the local 24-hour quickie mart, bought NyQuil to sleep, guzzled the NyQuil at the store that was 10 minutes away. Big sneeze equals swerve one time, stop, tried to breathe in the machine, tickle in his throat, no steady stream of air. That's better than that text that I just read to you. But you know what's best of all? Finding that powerful image. And here it is. He was sick as a dog. He was sick as a dog. And because of that, reasonable doubt exists in this case. And if you sit here and you use that sick as a dog, along with that entire text that's there, and you can put it right here in your presenter notes section, using the presenter slide, if you need that confidence part that's there, I use that, and this is from a real life case. It wasn't Uncle Drinky the drunk guy, and it wasn't Officer Righteous, so I changed that. And you know what the jury did after they saw that? They came and they gave me what I wanted, which was a not guilty. And the only thing they talked about after the trial was can they see the picture of the dog again? <laughs> so you got to find a powerful image that conveys everything that you're looking to do that makes sense to people and make it actionable. So let's take it from outside of the DUI context and see what you can do with the concept of reasonable doubt. This is the way I used to do it. Yeah. Someone who's, who's valet parking has a gold Toyota uh, license plate number ABU. All right. So we're talking about a concept, the theme of the case. That case, I used two slides. 
That was it. Talked to the jury for under 10 minutes. They came back after the prosecution went right before me. It was a short trial. It was a day and a half trial. And what they ended up doing was doing what all prosecutors do, which is intellectually bash them with the facts that they just heard. You don't need someone to tell you that it's the Mona Lisa. They know it's the Mona Lisa. And so the bottom line of it is you don't need to repeat to them every fact. That's boring. You need to tell the story. So let's do an example here with reasonable doubt. Okay, this is a way, this is a real life slide that I used to use in jury trials based upon a Pennsylvania pattern jury instruction. And I'd sit there and I'd read it just like this. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to talk to you about reasonable doubt. Now, what does reasonable doubt mean? Reasonable doubt is a doubt that would cause a reasonably careful and sensible person to hesitate before acting upon a matter of importance in his or own, her own life. A reasonable doubt must fairly arise out of the evidence that was presented or out of the lack of evidence presented with respect to some element of the crime. So to summarize, you may not, you must not, find the defendant guilty based upon mere suspicion of guilt. The Commonwealth at all times has a burden of proving the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If the Commonwealth does not meet its burden, then you must find him not guilty. Zero persuasive value on that. You have sat there and yawned, righteously so. What's better? Maybe some of you have seen this chart. Maybe some of you have used this chart. I would commend you to use this chart. What the chart does is talk about the levels of proof. And what you do is you start at the bottom and you say, if there's absolute, how powerful is reasonable doubt? It's so powerful that, of course, if there's no evidence, the result should be not guilty. If there's a scintilla, a grain of sand, grain of sand, that's what us lawyers mean by scintilla, that the result, of course, is not guilty. Reasonable suspicion, that's what's needed to pull a car over to do an investigation. If there's that much, the result is not guilty. Probable cause, which is a firm belief by a well-trained officer acting upon information, acting reasonably, that they can arrest someone but that's not enough to convict. Then there's, of course, preponderance, which is if you want to take money from one person, give it to another in our court system. That's generally what's needed. That 50.0001% being right. That's still not guilty. Clear and convincing evidence. That is the amount of evidence that's necessary to take a loving family and break it apart if there's a child that's being alleged to be abused. If that's how much evidence they have, the result must be not guilty. And if you have a reasonable doubt, then of course the result is not guilty. That's why you need to have it beyond a reasonable doubt. I used to give this slide, it's a pretty good slide, but I found a better one. That's still abstractions. Maybe you can relate it to the jury by talking about clear and convincing evidence, the necessary amount of proof to take a child out of a home. But I think this one's better, and it's much better. This, to me, is what proof beyond a reasonable doubt is. Secretariat won that race beyond a reasonable doubt. If the prosecution has not proven that case beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. Powerful images, few images, no text. That's reasonable doubt to me. Lesson number two. Lesson number two is to remember what is the use of slideware. It's to transfer concepts of belief to another person. And what it's not to be used for is a teleprompter where you read things. And here's my example. And it comes from a pretty funny movie that I hope you'll enjoy. Thank you. 
Volunteer Cowboy News. You stay classy, San Diego. Are you on Burgundy? Everybody knows Burgundy. Everybody knows Burgundy. Who typed a question mark on the teleprompter? For the last time, anything you put on that prompter, <coughs> Burgundy will read. RLQ1. After the photo mat was destroyed, the bear scampered back into the woods. Apparently, he wasn't too happy with his color print. <laughs> <laughs> From the entire Channel 4 News team, I'm Veronica Corningstead. And I'm Ron Burgundy. Go fuck yourself, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> Don't read it. It doesn't need to be read. In fact, the best thing you should do is have no text whatsoever. And number three is that the most, it's one of the most important points I can leave with you good folks, and that's to have a point. If you don't have a point when you're talking to people, don't talk. You know, Albert Einstein was a brilliant man, as we all know, and he said something that I, I always strive to do which is that he said, if you can't explain something simply, then you just don't understand it. So what we need to do is we need to explain something to folks very clearly and as briefly in as few words as possible. That's what resonates with folks instead of long drawn out explanations. So, you know, I suggest that you use the power of trilogy and that you give three or four reasons to support your point and that's all you do, is you make those main points. And like I said, Albert Einstein gave that great quote, that it should always be simple, always be brief. And apparently, being simple is not that easy for folks to do, especially us lawyers. For whatever reason, we want to make things more complex than they need to be. We want to sit there and make the standardized field sobriety test, for example, you know, why these things just don't work and we want to have all these statistics and everything like that. Or in a murder case, who shot John? If that's what the issue is, who cares what the ballistics are? Just because it's there, we need to have a point. Every word that comes out of your mouth needs to have a point that's there. And, you know, the most important thing is like this. Guess what? You guys have read this slide before I say to you, people read faster than you speak. So that means that you are useless if you're using it as a, as a teleprompter. So you know what? The great thing about PowerPoints and slideology and things of that general nature is that adding a slide costs you $0.0. Costs you nothing. So if you have a busy work slide like that original example I gave you, chop it into different points so it'll be better. Each slide should have no more than one point and one point that resonates. Get rid of everything else. Get rid of the text. And if you have a slide that uses your favorite slide, but it's crowded and it doesn't have, it has many, many points, then you should just scrap it because some of them are just completely helpless. So what you need to do is you need to be able to have a message that's scalable, something that you can tell people, whether it be five minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. You need to be able to scale it up and scale it down. You also need to be ready to rock and roll whenever you're called upon to do it. Like, for example, me. I was supposed to be the afternoon speaker. But because of the uh, situation with Pat Barone, I was asked to hop right in. And I'm glad to do so. And you want to know why? I prepared. I would rehearsed. And how presentations work, the most important thing is these three principles. Significance creates passion. It does. If you have a message that you believe in, people will believe in it too. That passion attracts attention. It just does. And then attention leads to action. We want the jury to act. So lesson four is to deliver with passion, with belief that you are right and that it makes sense. A passionate message is not necessarily a long message. Do you remember Brandy Chastain, Sports Illustrated? She had a passionate message. United States is the best in soccer. 
You also remember this, of course. This message had no text. Just some guy who stood in front of Tiananmen Square and said, not on my watch. He delivered his message with passion. If you ever seen this guy talk, my God, you could just sit there and listen to him talk for days. He's all about passion. He's all about belief. And there's other people who communicate with passion all the time. This is one of my favorite ones that's out there. I'd like to share it with you. Bill Kunstler, of course. He was such a great communicator that he was involved in a case that really troubled him. And if you haven't seen this documentary, Disturbing the Universe, as a defense attorney, you need to. It will inspire you. It inspired me. And what happened in one of his celebrated trials was there was an African-American fellow who was a drug dealer, and the police raided his place. They opened fire on him. They claimed that he shot the first bullet, and they never recovered a gun. And, uh, and then someone else had jumped out and tried to protect them because they thought they were getting raided by other rival drug dealers. There were three or four police officers who were killed. I want to talk about a difficult case to defend. And you know what his closing statement was? A portion of it, a snippet of it? He said, this case isn't about Esther Cleveland. It's about you. Because if you don't make the right decision, some point in time in your life, you're going to wake up screaming that you made the wrong decision because it was the popular decision. He got a complete and total not guilty in that case because he delivered it with passion. Passion is so important. If you don't have passion, don't speak. One of the greatest messages in our modern lives happened. And by the way, Bill Kunstler's message right there, two minutes and 20 seconds. And one of the most important messages that transformed our lives as a society that happened was this one right here, a message of love, a message of togetherness, a message of we can do better, we need to do better. And it's this one.
Some of you have come from areas where your first question is not. Unless you battle by the storms of persecution, staggered by the winds of the least brutality, you have been the veterans of created suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering gives redemption. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not follow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, Let's 
freedom rings from the hiding allegations of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the smoke out rockets of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the deadly of troops of California. But not only that, <coughs> let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside. Let freedom ring and when we happen. When we allow freedom ring. When we let it ring from every city, from every hamlet, from every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of us children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thanks so much, we are free at last. Six minutes, 20 seconds, he changed the world because he did it with passion, did it with a message. You don't need three hours. You can do it quick. This is not passion. Deliver with passion. Be actionable. If you can't find something to say, and you can't find a reason to speak, don't speak at all. That is a very controversial thing. If by the time your closing comes forward, if you don't have that belief, if you don't have that passion, if you don't have that power, don't speak. Believe. Believe. Make it resonate. Make it resonate. Now you could sit here and sum up everything that I said in one slide if you wanted to. That's basically what it looks like. But what sense does that make to show you instead of all the other slides that went before? One of the most important things that happens, tying back to where we were in the beginning, practice your presentation. In fact, practice your presentation the most. You have to rehearse. And guess what? I don't know if your house is like my house. I have a beautiful, <laughs> lovely, almost three-year-old daughter who's going to turn three on Monday. Love of my life, my best friend. And I have a wife who is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, and is very supportive. But they don't like to listen to my closings. <laughs> because they've heard a lot of them. But the bottom line of it is, even if you don't have an audience, set up a chair. Work on that eye contact. Work on that walking to make effect and all of those things. Look to make that handshake with your eyes to get the people to feel. You know, it's really simple. You got to get some feedback somewhere. It can't just be you in presentation, and that's the end goal. It has to be you presentation and recipient to action that's there. And you have to always, and this is a very important story that came true today, you always have to check out what the room is, like Tim was talking about earlier. But most importantly, that you have the right equipment 
I was freaking out earlier today because somewhere between, I was just in Nashville last, yesterday giving a presentation. And somewhere between Nashville and here, that little most important dongle that makes it go from a Mac to VGA so you guys can see my slideware. And let's face it, I'm supposed to be teaching about slideware. Somewhere it either got mislaid, mislost, or someone took it. I couldn't find it, so I was freaking out. And good thing here that my good friend Cleve over here saved the day, drove to his office and got his. Lesson learned. Usually I carry about three or four of everything with me. Somewhere along the lines of the last two weeks of my life where I presented four different times, I've lost all three or four of them. So, you know, the bottom line of it is stuff breaks. And yesterday I was down in Tennessee, and uh, I always send to the people that I do the presentations with a list of what I need. Lapel mics, high back chair, uh, VGA cable, projector, screen, because you can't take anything for granted. An audio tie-in and hook-in, because a lot of my things are audio related, because I want to get to that point in your brain like we were talking about before. Use a lot of clips to make it transferable. So I'm down in Tennessee yesterday. I'm presenting, and they had no audio tie-in or clip. And they had a best way to describe it is if you've ever seen a street preacher who has one of those little battery-powered microphones with a, with a little bass that's right there that's hardwire connected, that's the way they did it. Luckily for me, I brought my own speakers along with me like I always do in case there isn't a nice good setup like this. If I had not, I would have failed my mission, which was to communicate. So you need to always not only take someone for, you know, someone's word that it's going to be there. My experience in trying cases with these smart courtrooms, they're not smart. They're completely set up by people who have no idea about being a lawyer and presenting things, and much less about technology for some reason. So I always bring everything with me as if I had to do it on the street corner. And that's the most important thing, is have that backup. So you gotta have this presentation checklist, if you will. And this would be a fine example of a failure of a slide, wouldn't it? Too much information. But if you wanted to, you could take my entire presentation and shove it right in there. Because that's all the information that's there. Do you have significance? Why does it matter? Structure, simplicity, rehearsal. <laughs> rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And you know what? If you do it right, it all leads to one thing. And the one thing it leads to is that wow moment, that moment of connection with the people who are going to make decisions with you, that moment of the people who are going to make decisions about the person who's trusted you to defend them. That wow moment is what you're looking for. So at the end of the day, what you can get is you can get in a position where you get to do the not guilty dance, where you look back or your client does the not guilty dance and says, who, me? Oh, my goodness, this is wonderful. I got a not guilty. Yay! And they dance around, and they go around, and they have fun. And maybe if you have a high-profile case, maybe you folks, some of you folks in this room have done that, you get the opportunity, and it's a blessed opportunity when you have one of those pundits on TV that says you're crazy for even trying the case, such as, I don't know, that lady up there. <laughs> And you get to say, stick it. <laughs> so my entire point, my entire message is here. You can use PowerPoint totally ineffectively and wrong. And guess what? Most of us do that. I'm a convert. You can be a convert, too. If you're not using PowerPoint, you need to use it. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if it's always been your way. But in this day and age, jurors demand it and they expect it. It's different. You will instantly build more credibility than the prosecutor will if you use it correctly. And it's by using the right images, making it resonate, and make it make sense. So I thank you for your kind attention, and I look forward to the rest of the presentations. Thank you. <laughs>